This sermon is titled Leadership: The Four Cs of Leadership, Part Two. Be enriched as you listen. All right. So we've been, we started last Sunday talking about leadership, and of course we want to bring leadership and understanding of leadership from a biblical perspective. Last Sunday we introduced uh, the sermon series. We talked about the framework. which we refer to as the four Cs of leadership, the four Cs. So just to quickly recap, we mentioned the, four, the framework, having these four Cs have to do with character, competence, compassion, and charisma. So if you and I can keep this framework in our minds, and of course, you know, watch our own lives, how we are doing in, in relation to these four aspects as we all develop as leaders and none of us are born as perfect leaders we all grow in these things right so don't feel discouraged this morning if you hear something say well i'm not up to the mark in that area or this area hey, none of us are born that way we all have to learn we all have to acquire these uh, these things that we're talking about or let god work and develop these things in us but if we have this framework then at least we know what we are working towards how we can grow how we can develop in these things right so the intent here is not to discourage anybody and saying hey you don't match up to these four things you know the intent here is for all of us to grow in these things and these things come you know as we uh, learn and train and practice and we develop as leaders the best way to become a leader is to be a follower and also be a leader so you learn you know what a, what a, what a follower go, goes through and also learn what a leader goes through so you we have to learn to play both roles good leaders are also good followers amen so if you have to be a good follower if you want to be a good leader and then it helps us grow in these things so we talked about character last sunday just to quickly review we mentioned seven ingredients or seven traits that you look at when when you're seeing when you're looking for character and we'll just quickly review it should be up on the screen let's just uh say them out loud these are seven things we covered last sunday we talked about number one we talked about integrity accountability commitment courage diligence and uh, humility and respect so these are the seven things we talked about these comprise character we need to develop in all of these areas and see a character form and see character formation happen good character today we want to talk about the second aspect of this of this framework we want to talk about competence you know there are different leadership styles we all have you know none of us are identical just because we're all leaders doesn't mean we're all identical there are different leadership styles uh, some people are some are more people oriented some are more task oriented some are more transactional some are more transformational uh, some of us may be more uh, autocratic some of some may be more democratic uh, in their uh, way of doing things and also the fact is that in the course of our interactions and leadership we kind of we win and out of these various uh, uh ways of leading people so there there are different what we would say as leadership styles but as you're leading there are moments when you'll be a little bit more autocratic than democratic because you need to make a decision you need to move on move forward there are times when you be very democratic because you need to get all everybody on board and you know it, it really depends on the whole team so you'll be in and out of these different styles what people call as styles leadership style so uh, we learn to you know move in and out of these things similarly there are le- different leadership functions that as a leader you are functioning in different ways there are times and you you will have to be more of a visionary we'll talk a little bit about that today more strategic sometimes you'll have to be more playing the role of a more of a transformational as a change catalyst sometimes you play the role of a negotiator trying to you know arrive at a middle ground get people on board or you sometimes you'll be doing the role of an entrepreneur builder trying to see something get started going you'll be sometimes you play the role of an innovator come being more creative coming up with so- solutions or an executor making sure things happen or as a mentor or a coach trying to nurture people or even as an influencer trying to motivate people the point is that as a leader you're also stepping in and out of different functions are you with me 
Okay? Now, if you don't get all of this, it, the sermon notes are there, and the sermons are available on the church website, so you can always go back and listen to these things. Okay? But, the, you know, we move in and out of these functions, different styles and different functions. We move in and out of these things. Now, what we want to emphasize today is that leadership requires skill. Sometimes we have the wrong notion that leadership, all it takes is charisma. And we talk about charisma, but it's not just charisma. There is this important aspect of competence. Leadership requires skill. So think about David. And it's a very interesting verse, verses of Scripture in Psalm 78, verses 70 to 72 from the Good News Bible. Let's read it out together, please. It says, let's go. He chose his servant David. He took him from the pastures, where he looked after his flock. He made him king of Israel, the shepherd of the people of God. David took care of them with unselfish devotion and led them with skill. So how did David, you know, so of course, God took this ordinary man, made him a leader. Of course, he had to go through a process, and that process is very important because it helped form him as a leader. But as he led the people of God, notice what it says here. He led them with unselfish devotion, and he led them with skill. I like how the New King James says, he led them with the integrity of his heart and with the skillfulness of his hands. So there is integrity involved, character. We discussed this last Sunday. Today we're talking about leading with skill, with the skillfulness of his hands. Are you with me? So leadership requires skill, and this can be developed. We can learn these things. We can let, you know, of course, we prayerfully, we pray about it, but of course there are other ways to learn and develop these skills. And when you talk about competence, we're talking about a, a mix, a coming together of knowledge, skills, abilities, and experience. So what is competence? It's this coming together of knowledge, skills, abilities, and experience. You know, somebody with a lot of experience, you look at them and say, wow, that's a really competent person. I mean, he's got all this experience behind him. So it's coming together of that. Now, in times past, when people looked at somebody who was competent, you know, if he was very muscular, very strong, very tall, it's a very competent person. But that's gone. Those days are gone. Today, in most cases, competence has to do with what you know, with the abilities you have, with the skills you have, and the experience you have, and may have nothing to do with how big your muscles are. <laughs> it's not dependent on your physical strength. It, it has to do with what your knowledge and your skill. And, and, and so competence is, is a complex mix of, of these things that we must have. Now, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10 says this. It says, if the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. So if you look, imagine, if you think about the axe as your skill, your competence. If the axe is dull, what are you going to do? It's going to cost you a lot more to get the job done. You're going to expend a lot more energy to get the job done. But if the axe is sharp, can get, get the job done quick. So you're talking about competence and your skills. You, you sharpen your skills, your knowledge, your abilities, and of course you grow with experience. What happens? You're going to be able to get the job done quickly, efficiently, uh, and in an optimal way. Are you all with me? So we must learn to develop or sharpen the axe edge in our lives. And, you know, competence is so, is so important because... It expresses our capability. People look at your capability and they come to you because of, of your capability. You know, they know what you can do. Or it also expresses your capacity, what you're able to handle. They say, okay, this person can handle so much, we can give that to him. Or this person can only handle so much, so let's not put more. Right? Your competence, what, what can you handle? The capacity and also the confidence that people will have in you. So if you're more confident, people have confidence in you as a leader. So competence is important because it expresses your capability, your capacity, and it generates confidence that people have in you. You all with me so far? Yes? Okay. So, Proverbs 22, verse 29. Let's read it out, please. Do you see a man who excels in his work? 
He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown, unknown men. A person who excels in his work. He's really good. And if some other versions put it like this, he's an expert in his business. He's skillful in his work. He does his job well. So a person who's skillful, he's an expert, he's got confidence, what happens? He's going to have the higher places open up for him. Okay? Now, competence, of course, is specific towards your role or towards the area in which you work. And if you are in a, 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 a software developer, of course, you know, and within software development, you can have so many different programming languages, or you could be a designer, an architect, and all, all different roles. And so depending on your work, you, you, you need to be competent in that. That's job specific or role specific. But what I want to share with us today are seven skills that are general to the competence of a leader in any area. So it doesn't matter what area you're involved in, these seven skills or abilities comprise competence and are required in all of us as leaders. So these are the general skills. Are you with me? Okay. So we will all have to have our specific areas of com uh, competence depending on the areas of work. But here are the seven ones. And then people look for this. Number one, and I'm going to go through this quickly, uh, uh, so stay with me. Number one, visionary. A leader is a visionary. What does it mean to be a visionary? It means you're able to see the invisible. It means you're not only able to see the way things are, you're able to see the way things can be. Because remember we said yes last Sunday, leadership is about taking yourself and at least one other person from where you are to where you should be. A leader is able to see where we should be. Are you with me? Right? So you don't just see the way things are. You can see the way things should be. Example, if you look at a slum, you can say, oh, poor people, they're going to be like this for the rest of their life. Or you can say, well, I can see where they could be. I can see them coming out of their poverty. I can see them having a better life. That's a visionary. You see children on the streets. You might say, oh, so sorry for them. Or you could say, well, hey, if we educate these people, if you take these kids, give them a, you know, give them a good home and educate them, they could have a great life. That's a visionary. You're not just seeing the way things are, you're seeing the way things, how things could be. And leaders need to be visionaries. See, uh, Proverbs 29 verse 18, a verse that's well known to all of us. The Bible says, in the old King James, it says, where there, let's fill it, let's fill the blanks, where there is no vision, the people, let me hear you loudly, perish. The New King James says, where, the people, where there's no vision, they become lawless. Where there is no vision, people perish. That means there is no life. They stop being productive. They don't accomplish anything. Or being lawless. That means there is, they are without any restraint. There's nothing guiding them. They're all over the place. So vision motivates us, inspires us, helps us become productive, enables us to live life with purpose, and keeps us all on the same course, in direction, rather than being all over the place. A vision is so important. Jesus put it like this in Matthew chapter 5. He said, the light of the body is the eye. If the eye is good, the body is full of light. But if the eye is bad, full of darkness. How great is the darkness? A clear vision brings light. And you need light if you're going to walk properly. If you don't have light, you're going to fall into the potholes. Many of them in Bangalore. <laughs> You'll end up on the ditch somewhere. The point is, your vision, a clear vision, brings light. Another place, and it's not on the screen, in Luke 6, verse 39, Jesus said, if the blind lead the blind, they all end up in there. So imagine if the leader is blind, meaning no vision, don't know where you're going, can't see the way, and you're leading people. Whoa. So a leader has to have vision. Very important. It's got to be a visionary. It's got to be able to see where we're going and uh, where we have to arrive at. Number two, are you with me so far? Is strategizing. To strategize means you have this overall plan of why, what, and how. Why are we doing this? How are we going to do this? What do we need 
to do this. Right? Strategize. A high-level plan. It's, you can think of it like a blueprint. Uh, before a building is constructed, an architect draws up the blueprint. So you can just imagine this. You, you take somebody, you see, what do you see? You get them standing in front of a big empty plot. What do you see? I see nothing. Just empty land. Somebody else says, I see this beautiful, big building. Visionary. Then you bring the architect. The architect draws up the blueprint. That's strategy. Then you bring the civil engineer, the contractor. They will start building the walls and doing, putting all of That's planning and execution. Right? So second important part of being a leader is strat being uh, able to strategize, to have this ability to think at a high level, to know where, to, how we, where we are going, why we are doing it, and how we are going to get there, and what's needed to get there, to think about this end-to-end -end game plan, so to speak. Are you with me? And strategy, of course, can come through us bringing knowledge and information together. You put information together. And usually strategy happens along with the unknowns. Because when you're strategizing, you don't have all the answers. There are unknowns. And you know that here are things that I don't know much about. Uh, I, I am, I'm aware of these unknowns. But if something happens, I am prepared to handle something. But it's in, when you're planning, it's very detailed. You, you talk about time, cost, people. It's very tightly controlled when you're planning. So planning is different from strategizing. Strategizing can happen, like we said, through information we get received. But strategizing can also happen through inspiration and revelation. God can inspire this. Amen? And we see so many examples of this in the Bible. You know, when here comes Joseph. Pharaoh, or Potiphar, brings him out, says, you know, can you interpret these dreams? And Joseph says, you're going to have seven years of famine, and sorry, seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. He interpreted the dream. Wonderful. But that doesn't solve the problem. What are you going to do about this? Then he comes up with a strategy. He says, during your seven years of plenty, you save up 20%. So that in your seven years of famine, you take this and you'll have enough to give to the people, to sell back to the people. That's strategy. Pharaoh looks at him. He says, where can we find such a man like this in whom the Spirit of God is? Right? So then he says, now, you got the strategy. Please go ahead and execute it. <laughs> you know, we'll talk about execution a little later. But the wonderful thing is God gave him not only interpret interpretation of the dream, but God gave him a strategy to solve the problem. This is how you can solve it. It's a high-level thing, but we need that high-level strategy. Many times when David goes out to battle, God speaks to him. David, go stand by the mulberry trees. And when you hear the sound in the, of, of hooves moving up in the air around the mulberry trees, then you go into battle. And David followed that, and he won many battles. Joshua, on the, bank, uh, on the edge of the river Jordan, he looks in it, and he sees Jericho. They have never done this before. First time going to try to capture a fortified city. How are we going to do it? No drones. <laughs> no aircrafts. How are we going to do this? God gives him a strategy. And of course, this was a very supernatural strategy. March around the walls. I'll knock him down. Right? But the point is, God gives us strategy. So be open to that as well. And um, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11. Solomon wrote, he said, I return and saw unto the sun that the race is not to the swift. Now the battle to the strong nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. So, knowledge is important, skill is important, understanding is important, being wise is important, being strong and swift is important, but you need to know how to seize time and opportunity. All of that is important, but you also need the ability to grasp or Take a grip on, seize the time and the opportunity. Are you with me? And that's part of strategy. 
Strategy is able to recognize time and opportunity. The Bible talks about in 1, Corinthians, 1 Chronicles 12.32, the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Strategy. They recognized times and they said, this is what you should be doing now. Strategy. Are you with me? All right. Some people have already gone home. <laughs> Number three. Communication. So another important skill, a competence we must all have, is ability to communicate or develop. Ability to communicate. Joel 2.11 says, the Lord gives voice before his army. So God is not only leading the army, but he's speaking ahead. He's saying, giving commands, giving, speaking his voice uh, before his army so the army can follow. And as a leader, you need to speak very clearly. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 8, it says, If the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? Now, the trumpet in the old Bible times was used to call people into battle, move people into battle, and so on and so forth. So if the trumpet was making an uncertain sound, people won't know. Did, did he say go or did he say stop? They won't know. And a leader cannot afford to make an uncertain sound. The, the voice of the leader should be very clear, very crisp, uh, very definite, very precise. This is what we are going to do. Communication, very important. Are you with me so far? Right? So another important skill and ability for us to develop as leaders is the ability to communicate. And Nehemiah is a great example of this. The book of Nehemiah is a great study in, in leadership and uh, Nehemiah 2 verse 18, after Nehemiah comes and surveys the place, so he's developed a strategy, then he talks to the people. It says in Nehemiah 2 18, he says, I told them of, my, of the good hand of God upon me and the king's words that he had spoken, and notice the reaction of the people. They said, let us rise up and build. See, so he communicated and people were mobilized. Let's do it. So communication is so important. When you want to motivate your team, motivate people who are following you, that it's so clear. And, and Nehemiah knew how to communicate that, the vision that God had put in his heart to the people and mobilize them into the work of God. Number four is people skills. Now, we need to know how to work with people. It's very seldom that a vision is accomplished by one person alone. We work together, work as a team. And the Bible tells us that Ecclesiastes 4 and and verse, things, verse 9, it says, two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor. So as a people, as a leader, you need to know how to get people together, work together, how to motivate them, how to resolve people problems, how to address people problems, and, and so on. And you learn how to do this. And I've made many mistakes along my journey, just right in the church, you know, trying to work with people. And, it, and we keep learning. And I'm not perfect, but... You learn through the mistakes, you become a better leader, and you make sure you don't, you know, just don't repeat those mistakes. You learn through it. You learn how to motivate people, how to build people, how to create a culture of team. I can, you know, yesterday we had a men's conference, and um, it was just so amazing. And I just, everything was so nice. And I'm not bragging. <laughs> I'm not bragging. I'm just saying everything was so good. I was like, wow, man, these guys, they just work as a team. Everybody's working, the church staff and the volunteers. They all just work together to bring it all together. And I was like, wow, this is such a good team. They all did a great job. Yeah? And, and, and that's, that's the way we should be. We should have a culture of teamwork. Where, you know, doesn't matter. Everybody just do the things. We've, and the end result is we want to have you know, the final result to be good. And so we just work as a team. It's not about any individual uh, getting any attention. So you resolve people's problems as well. Number five, we need to be able to plan. That is, you prepare, you forecast, you, you, with prudence, uh, you plan. You carry, you, this, this is how the work is going to be done. Planning is important. Proverbs 22 verse 3 says, A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself. That means a prudent man is able to look ahead and see what needs to be done, see what course of action to take, and then he's preemptive of things that could go wrong, right? A prudent man. Uh, so, number six, 
I'll just get into an example before we close. And I just may finish these seven points. Number six is execution. Execution is the ability to make things happen. It's great to have a vision. It's great to have a strategy. It's great to do the planning, put it all on paper. But if you don't execute, eternity will come and go. <laughs> It'll still be on paper. So a good leader is able to execute it and make it happen. Right? So which means that you know, you, you've got these resources. You've got time. You've got money. You've got people. You've got your plan. You've got your vision, strategy. All of that is in place. Now put it all together and bring out the end result. Execution. A good leader should be a good executor. Going back to the example of Joseph. If Joseph had interpreted Pharaoh's dream and given him, given him the strategy, uh, but gone off to sleep, we don't know if people would have been saved. But Pharaoh said, I want you to execute. I'm giving you the responsibility. I'm making you the prime minister. Second in charge to me. Make this happen. And he made it happen. Lives were saved. Execution is important. And number seven, lastly, is learning. Good leaders are good learners, and they're constantly learning. You know, we're living in a day and age where a certificate that you earned five years ago may mean nothing today. It's outdated. And especially in the area of technology, you can say, I've, I've, got, I've got this. And I remember, while I was involved. We had all these kind of certificates. And I look, I look at it today and say, like, nobody even talks about those kinds of things today. Those certificates are almost invalid today. Think technology has changed. There's new technology. And, and, and people want skills, different type of skills. And so a good leader is a good learner. And he's constantly learning. So we've got to constantly uh, you know, upskill or reskill or retrain, constantly learning in your area of, of, uh, of your field of work. You know, think about what the Bible says, Proverbs 13, verse 16. Every prudent man acts with knowledge. It means he's acquiring knowledge. Proverbs 18, 15. The heart of the prudent acquires knowledge. And means constantly learning. He's acquiring knowledge. He's assimilating He's learning. So as a leader, we must learn. And, and this might uh, be redundant, but there's this book that was written by Dr. Bradley Statz. He was a behavioral scientist and operations expert, uh, published by Harvard Business Review Press. The title of the book is simply this, Never Stop Learning. Stay relevant, reinvent yourself, and thrive. And he says, and I'm just quoting from his book, this one or two sentences. He says, today's fast-paced, ever-changing global economy requires us to never stop learning or we risk becoming irrelevant. Savvy leaders recognize this means investing in their own learning journey so that they can develop the processes and behaviors required for ongoing success. So you're constantly learning for yourself. And if you learn, then it motivates those following you to learn as well. And one of the simple ways to always be learning is by being a good observer and a good listener. Just observe and listen. You'll be learning almost all the time. So part of being a good learner is be a good observer and a good listener. You will learn a lot. So, to sum up, what are the seven general skills? Let's say it out together. Number one, visionary, strategizing, communication, people skills, planning, execution, and learning. See, last year, during the second COVID wave, the first COVID wave the year, towards the end of 2019, uh, early part of 2020, uh, you know, it seemed like it was happening, but it was happening out there, little away. But the second COVID wave, when it hit, it was very near, meaning people we knew, those around us, were being affected and impacted. And, and so during the second COVID wave, we, you know, uh, the big question was, what are we going to do about it? We were hearing, getting a lot of news of, 
you know, churches, others being affected. And, you know, so what is the church doing about it? What are you going to do about it? And of course, you know, we rallied to take care of our own people. You know, they were people helping people, delivering food, visiting homes, uh, I mean, delivering, getting food delivered to homes and things like that. So that was happening. But for the church at large, what are you going to do? And then there are the churches outside in smaller places where they needed help. Now, what are you going to do? Uh, and so I think it was the month of May last year um, where you know, we, we normally have a pastor's meeting on the second Wednesday of every month. We invite pastors to come together. Uh, uh, but then all of that stopped because of COVID. But last, then in May, when, when, when this pressure was up, what is the church going to do about, you know, how are we going to help other churches who are struggling? Uh, we said, okay, we've got to do something. So let's find out from the pastors what can we do. We called for a pastor's meeting online. So about 70 people connected. And we had this call. And we discussed, what can we do? Uh, a lot of ideas were being shared. And... Uh, uh, mm-hmm. It was almost an hour and a half meeting, and uh, but then there was no conclusion, and we didn't know what to do. So we ended the meeting, and I was disturbed. And I'm just sharing this as an example, right? Not to promote myself or promote APC. <laughs> I'm just sharing this example. People can relate to examples. So at the end of that meeting, just say, "Okay, God, you know, we've had this meeting, no conclusion. What to do? We can't just continue like this, and we need to do something quick, because." Right now, people are suffering. It's not two months from now or two years from now. It's right now. We have to do something quick. And that night, I really couldn't sleep because I was just thinking, God, I mean, no conclusion. What are we going to do? When I woke up that morning, the next morning, in my mind, like a clear plan. I said, okay, we have to do something. And we can't, you know, we've been working with pastors together in the city since the early 2000s. So we know how things happen. We know what it takes to get something done. But right now, we need to act very quickly so we can't be you know, bothered about that whole process of trying to get everybody together and have meetings and calls. And we can't do that. We don't have time for that. We have to act fast. So the first step was in this plan that came into my mind was get permission from all the leaders that APC will do this by themselves. Because I knew we had the people, we had the ID infrastructure, we had the email list, we had everything in place. We just had to press the buttons and things will happen. So I just sent an email. Eight leaders were there on the meeting. I said, Pastor, pastors, I just want your permission. APC will do this. And I outlined what we're going to do. APC will do this on behalf of the body of Christ. I just need your okay. All of them replied, okay. That afternoon, called for a staff meeting. Guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to reach out. And these are the six offerings we're going to make for people who need help. But we need to get this up and running in three days. We don't have time. ID team worked long hours. Others were putting information together. Others were planning, getting teams ready. In three days, the email went out. Now, we didn't know what to expect. The initial plan was, let us help other churches in Bangalore. Then, let, or let us help other churches in Karnataka. That was our initial thought. We sent the email out. And then we received requests from every state in India. We thought we'll receive maybe 50 requests for help and we'll be able to do that. 100, 200, 1,000, 7,000 requests came in. So it seemed like we're overwhelmed. It seems so scary because you've made a commitment to help these people. And then to add to the complexity of things, we saw that there were people who were making multiple applications. The worst case was one person applied with 17 different bank accounts. (laughs) So he said, hey, we were not prepared for all this kind of problems. So now came another problem. We have to check every application. We can't just go by the application. So we had this whole team of about 20 or 25 people covering 14 languages, calling people to verify every application. We had the IT team doing their analysis, eliminating duplicate, you know, weeding out duplicate applicants with by num- phone numbers and uh, bank accounts and addresses and all this, getting rid of all that data. And so, uh, you know, we, we actually brought a huge volume of data down to about seven, 8,000. And then the whole process began of dispatching and sending the help out to the people. 
But at the end of July, you know, uh, the work was done. The point is this. All of these things, the seven things we talked about, came into effect to make that thing happen. Amen? And then we continued. From there, we evolved into an India Care Project, taking care of these 10,000 more pastors, continue to call them, care for them. And then we're not phasing that out because, you know, it's been more than a year. We've done our best to take care of them. But it was a teamwork. All, the whole staff, and we had a lot of more people working together, making it happen. So just as an example, you know, in different areas, we need to be able, we need competence. We need to be able to bring things together and make things happen if we are going to bless lives, if you're going to help people and get things done. A few closing thoughts here before uh, we let you go home to sleep. Develop competencies specific to your area of work, right? So continue to do that. Each one of us are engaged, involved in different things. So we encourage you, you know, develop competencies in your area of work. And the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Whatever you find to do, do it with all your might. Give it your best in what you do. Give it your very best. There are some thoughts here on developing competencies. God empowers us. We learn and we practice. We observe. Uh, we mentor. And we also impart. I want to close with this verse, in, or these verses in Psalm 90. Worship team, please come. Psalm 90, verse 16. When I say worship team comes, it's the cue for all of us to wake up. <laughs> Psalm 90. Nobody wants to see you sleeping when everybody else is standing. No, just joking. Psalm 90, verses 16 and 17. The psalmist prayed. And this is from the Passion Translation. Says, let us see your miracles again, and let the rising generation see the glorious wonders you're famous for. O Lord our God, let your sweet beauty rest upon us and give us favor. Let's read the last part of Psalm verse 17. Let's read it. Come work with us, and then our works will endure and give us success in all we do. Let's read that again. Come work with us, and then our works will endure and give us success in all we do. Lord, come and work with me. Whatever you're doing, God, come and work with me. I'm not doing this by myself. God is with me. Come work with me. Then our works will endure. It'll produce fruit. It'll be good. Then our works will endure and God will give us success in all that we do. And may this be true for each of us. Amen. Let's rise to our feet, please. Character is important as a leader. And may we all develop those traits of character. Competence is important as a leader. We've listed six, seven general skills, competencies, competencies we need as leaders. And may God build this in each of us. May each of us be good leaders in whatever capacity, whatever role, whatever place, whatever opportunity. God has given to us. Maybe be good leaders. Providing good leadership. Maybe be competent leaders. The beautiful thing is, you and I can invite God to work with us. Oh God, work with us. So that our works will endure. They'll bear fruit. They'll have lasting impact. And you will give us success in all that we do. Let the glory of the Lord our God, the beauty of the Lord our God be seen upon us. Please take a few moments just to pray. Invite God 
Like the psalmist prayed, you pray, or in your own words, pray your own prayer. God, this is what I'm doing. This is my work. This is the place where I am. Come work with me. Bless all the work of my hands. Let the beauty of the Lord my God be seen in what I do. Father, I pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ over each of us, God. You've given us the opportunity to live, to serve. And wherever you've placed us, whatever opportunity you've given us, help us to do it with all our heart, with all our might. And come work with us with each of us. Establish the work of our hands. Make it strong. Make it fruitful. Make it a blessing to people. Establish the work of our hands. And let glory be given to you. Let people see our good works and glorify our Heavenly Father who is in heaven. Let them see our good works and glorify our Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray that when people go to their offices tomorrow or their schools or their campuses tomorrow and they see them at work, let the glory of God be seen on your people. Let people see their good works and ask them about you. Let people see the work they do, the way they interact, the way they move, and let them ask your children about their heavenly Father. May it happen, God, wherever we are, wherever you've placed us, as we interact with people, May we, may our lives be signposts. May the work we do be signposts pointing to you, Father. Empower us and grace our lives, we pray. Thank you. Thank you.
have a quick announcement. We, uh, we are resuming our mission trips and it's going out across the nation to minister. Uh, Pastor Nancy Ramyo handles that. She's put a schedule for the rest of the year. So if you go to our church website, apcwo.org slash missions, uh, there's a calendar of where we are going, what needs to be done. Uh, we welcome everyone. You know, if you'd like to do that, you just have to register for which way you want to go. It's a great opportunity uh, to go uh, meet believers across India, you know, serve them. And usually these trips are two or three days short. Go serve people. So go over to apcw.org slash missions. See if you would like to go on any of those trips. Send an email. And uh, Pastor Nancy will get back to you and help you get ready for it. Uh, so we invite you to do that. If you can't do it this year, next year, I'm sure we will do a lot more. So uh, slowly, we are bringing that back up. And all these pastors that we've served for the last year, we are going to be inviting them to these places. So now we will do things differently. Let's establish relationship and so on and, and, and work with them. And so, so get involved. Amen. It'll be so inspiring when you walk into one of those brick, hot, humid mm. buildings and see those people worship with just a tabla. Not none of these beautiful people singing in <laughs> bands. You'll be inspired. Wow. These people love Jesus. You know, the way they worship. They don't have what we have. They don't have an air-conditioned <laughs> hall. But when you see them, it'll inspire your faith, our faith. Make us stronger. You know, I want to encourage you. Go. Be a part of one or more of these trips this year, next year. See how people love Jesus around the country in different difficult situations. Serve them. Encourage them. Be a blessing. We invite everyone to be a part of it. Let's close. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, 
and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.